officially, officially live, broadcasting only on OneDealAway.com. This is Money Matters. My name is Nev, and today is Saturday, October, I don't know, uh, October 10th. I didn't check. I didn't check. But today we have excellent news. Super excited to share the stuff with you. So what in the world are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to be discussing a little bit about what's going on with Trump and Biden and where they stand on the mortgage and finance. We're going to be talking about some affordable lakeside properties that you can get into. We're going to talk about what's happening with universities and colleges and the closures and what the sort of trend is, where are things going. Uh, of course, we're going to be talking about the California tax hike yet again. And we're going to be discussing the cryptocurrency enforcement framework that I have been sharing with you yesterday that I said I was going to read for you and we're going to take a look at what's inside this report to understanding. And so I read all of 80 some pages, which is why I'm running slightly behind this morning because uh, it's, a, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of reading in addition to preparing everything else as well, right? So I do want to welcome everybody watching this live today on OneDealAway.com. If you're live here, please make sure you sign in, say hello, and of course, we're going to do Q&A at the end of the show. If you're not watching this live, but you're watching a replay somewhere on like YouTube or maybe even Facebook, well, in that case scenario, make sure you do me a huge favor. Do smash the like button, do forward it to the friends you think might enjoy it, and consider subscribing and hitting the bell button on YouTube so you get notified when we go live, which is every single day. And of course, if you are into things like money and wealth and uh, real estate and crypto, and you know, sometimes we talk about macro pictures, sometimes we talk about um, the stocks and the bonds and the money and where is it all going. Uh, we talk about precious metals and businesses. So if you're into all of that stuff, this show is likely for you. And of course, every so often I probably put a little bit of a twist. It's just not just sort of like sharing what the news are, but also what we can do about it to make sure that we do well from it. Um, so there you go. If that's it for you, let's do this. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully you are drinking your coffee or tea, have done some yoga, stretching, meditation. I know I started to get back into it and I'll be very honest with you, as we get into the fall, I get way better about eating healthier, taking care of my body and myself. I don't know what it is. It's like summer and you just sort of like let go and you eat sometimes a bit more food than you should, right? And you cheat a bit more food-wise, food-wise, cheating food-wise, right? Uh, for me, I have very strict regimen. And when summer comes, I'm like, forget it. I'm just going to go nuts. <laughs> and I do, and I do, and I do. All right, so let's take a quick look at what's going on in the crypto marketplace. And then we're going to go into the report and talk about that stuff because it is very, very, very very important we do that so um, you know my apologies for him just make a small but you know as you know when i scroll and if it's not this small then it's like that's like really funky thing and i don't know why uh, but anyways uh, as you can see when we scroll down and just keep on looking at the middle one you will see this predominantly green although although we do have some uh, red ones here and there so it's not like completely green market day like it was yesterday that was amazing wasn't that amazing that was absolutely amazing but the good news is that uh, bitcoin has also yet again pumped up 2.3 percent in the last 24 hours and it's now at eleven thousand three hundred dollars so if you recall we were at just eleven thousand uh yesterday eleven thirty six or something like that Today it's eleven three hundred, so we've pumped good like two hundred and seventy-five dollars or something like that, right? Two hundred sixty-five, something like that. 
Uh, let's see, ETH, ETH has also done really well, up 3.5% to 371.87 cents. And then, of course, we, you know, as we scroll down, you can see that in the top 100, like most of the things are doing really well. If it is, uh, you know, red, it's like negative 0.0, .0 like give me a break, or 0.3 or 0 0.1, so it's like, um, uh, and it, the one with the 0 0.1 is the USDC, so it's a stable coin, so it doesn't even count. But overall, overall seems to have been doing pretty darn okay. If we take a look at the max, the top gainers, Yuma, once again, 33% and 24 hour uh, gain, AR 18.5, SC 14.8, NXM 10.3, ADA 9, uh, Energy Web EWT Energy Web Token uh, 8.9 Ave, uh, that's the new one, right? Not the Lend one, the Ave one. Uh, 8.5 SNT, uh, I believe that's synthetics. No, yes. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, 7.8 and so on. So you can see that there's some, you know, pretty darn good uh, pumps happening. When it comes to on the other end of the thing, um, you know, the biggest uh, sort of a dumper, if you would, is YFI yet again. So it's gone from let, like 12,000 up to like, what, 19,000 uh, yesterday. And now it has actually come down since that time to uh, $17,035.93. So it's down 9.7%. Uni is down 4.1%, Ocean down 3.8%, Sol 3, uh, EGLD 2.6%, ADAX uh, 2% down, SXP 1%, 1.7%, BAL uh, 1.6%, REN 1.6%, uh, LEO 1.5%, RUNE 1.4%. So as you can see, it keeps on going down like super, super like small. So mostly, again, predominantly Green Day, we do have some dumps over the 24 hour. Vast majority of them are nothing. Probably the biggest one uh, is going to be YFI, which is, you know, just under 10%. Um, and even for crypto, that's not like a huge, but again, um, potentially, potentially, uh, relatively speaking, a biggie. A relatively speaking, biggie. Overall, very positive market. Now, we do have this report. That I was telling you about that it's like 83 pages worth of the report and of course because it's a PDF and stuff um, it did not allow me to highlight anything so my apologies for that so we're gonna go through this together uh, and hopefully uh, you know as you can see that they divided the report into three parts the first one they basically look at the basic of the crypto what the legitimate illegitimate uses are uh, role of the darknet market and it's a very um, when I read the report like it's very good it's very well written it's a very good report uh, but the challenge is it's written by law enforcement officials nothing wrong with those guys I thank them every single day for everything they do super supportive of them but they tend to see the world through a bit different eye where I look at things, I always look at the good stuff. You know, we walk into the crowded room. I go in with my buddies who are in law enforcement. You know, I go in and I'm looking at the beauty of the building and the arrangements and how everybody is dressed. They walk into the building. They're looking. Who's looking suspicious? Where are my exits? Where do I sit so that nobody's behind me? Right? Like, their viewpoint is very different than ours. And so I point that out because in reading that report, you know, you will see that a lot of it is very focused on like criminality and misuse and that kind of stuff. And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that crypto, that's all it is. Right. And even they, God love them. They try to look at the positive. They just really struggle. That's not their strong suit. They're strong. So, and I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, you know, what do they deal with all day, all night, like all day, all night, they deal with, well, criminals, right? They listen to horrible stories. They witness horrible things, you know, uh, when when the shooting happens, you know, hopefully you and I are not around. But when we are, we drop down and run away. These are the guys that 
stand up and run towards. So you have to have a very different type of mentality and different type of training and different viewpoint of the world to do the job. So I think that that was important concept to understand, to put ourselves into the shoes of people that are writing this stuff, that are reporting on this stuff, okay? It's not bad. It's just a different way of looking at stuff. Fair? Um, then they talk about law, uh, law and regulations and ongoing challenges and future strategies, right? So very, very lengthy thing, and it starts really with the um, introduction and kind of what it was set up, and it was really them wanting to understand what this is and set up the, the rules, what the challenges are, which is very fast-moving technology. They briefly do talk about the Web 3.0, and if you don't know about Web 3.0, it's basically the new web that is attached to the blockchain, that is integrating with it, that is allowing us to utilize cryptocurrency as a medium of exchange uh, for our content, for our advertising, for our viewing, right? It's what we earn when we go to, uh, you know, a Brave Browser, which, by the way, by the way, quick poll over here, Brave Browser, um, love it, enjoy it. They are changing some stuff, and I'm noticing definitely some challenges when I'm trying to, like, search for things, you know, it used to find it, and now it, like, takes me to, the, like, a Yahoo main search page, and then you got to open the. So it's making it a bit more challenging. I'm not in love with some of the stuff, and I've also noticed that if I don't restart my browser often or whatever, like, if I have it open for a few days because I'm working on stuff and I'm not shutting things down, um, which I know you're going to say, you should, you should. I, I get it. I'm trying to save it, and I just don't have enough time in a day to get everything done that I need to do and I don't want to like restart all of the projects so I just kind of keep it running and then I will like restart my computer in a you know like four or five days or something like that so probably not the healthiest thing to do I get it but every so often I have to do that stuff and so when that happens uh, Brave won't even won't even find me like won't even open the new stuff when I'm searching so um, so one thing that I don't enjoy but anyways I digress I digress uh, so when they talk about the Web 3.0, and then here we go, we get into the part one, the enforcement framework. And so they're talking about the fact that technology is evolving and it's a good thing. However, that oftentimes the uh, criminals use the technology and the emergence of it, the lack of knowledge of it, to take advantage of the system of the people and of course, um, you know, they want to basically take care of that stuff. And now they're using the cryptocurrency as that technology to basically benefit themselves as opposed to benefit the entire world. Right. So it makes sense. It makes sense why they want to take a look into it. Right. So they they basically take a time to explain what cryptocurrency is, what some legal authorities, partnerships are like who's working together and kind of like an approach to explain how they're going to address the stuff so they talk about the virtual currency and what it is and how it works centralization decentralization how it goes from like you know one wallet to another wallet and how you get it into the cash what the options are it's very very good it's an excellent primer on how it all works it talks about like the basic uh, key terms like what is blockchain what is a wallet what are miners you know what's an address that kind of stuff so you can understand it and then it talks about the legitimate use of things, which is really um, for us to conduct business, to sell goods, services, products, uh, to be able to pay our employees, for example, to be able to, you know, crowdfund for, you know, for projects that we believe in and that kind of stuff, right? All kinds of cool things, micropayments, um, you know, the, the banking for the unbanked, the ability to transfer funds uh, with the low cost and those kinds of things. But then they're talking about illicit uses. And as you can see, the legitimate uses, it's very, very short. And then when they get into illicit uses, I mean, boy, this thing continues. Like I said, these are the guys that are just, that's that's all they're seeing all day, every day. And so they're like used to it, trained, and that's what they do. That's their thing, illicit uses. So, of course, they have this like super adorable. Let me see if I can blow this up, uh, make it bigger, because this just made me chuckle, right? And why are criminals always have a triangle head? That's what I want to know. If anybody knows that, let me know. Let me know. Why do they have, you know, is it because they look more like a rat, like a mouse, and we, like, instinctively find that, like, repulsive, right? 
um, is that what it is? But you know, um, I don't know. But now with like you know, darken, uh, darken, uh, you know, the shades and the the face masks, all of us look a little bit like criminals these days. I know I do. Every time I'm like, oh my gosh, I look like I'm about to rob a bank. Every time I feel like you know, I'm putting stuff on, and because of my glasses, the masks don't work as well because <coughs> excuse me, they fog up. And so then I have to put the bandana. I find the bandanas work way better. They don't fog off my glasses. But I really look like I'm about to go <laughs> rob something. I'm like, oh, geez, Louise, Louise. And then, then my favorite piece is if I go in and I buy, like, you know, some uh, uh, drinks or whatever, like a uh, uh, cider or wine or something like that, they're like, we need to see your ID. And I'm like, I, I have a hat. I have shades. I have a face mask, and you're going to be able to identify me by looking at my ID. Really? Really? Are you sure about that? Because, so anyways, you know, um, welcome to the new normal. Okay, let's continue. Enough side chatter, Nev. So they're talking about how, you know, the, they use the, the cryptocurrency directly to commit crimes and support the terrorism, and they, of course, will use uh, this, you know, uh, what what it all looks like and you know the ransoms and how money goes in and of course they they have gone out and put a lot of they have put a lot of uh, what you might call it um, sorry let me adjust myself over here uh, they put a lot of the um, examples of like what has transpired and stuff so you know the welcome to video and of course the site has been seized this was the dark web uh, then the dark scandals, he talks about that stuff. And here is my thing, which is really one of the funny pieces. Uh, they're talking about how Al-Qaeda is being financed and stuff. And here's my thing. You know, this has existed and has been financed even without cryptocurrencies. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of like silly to, to talk about that it's only cryptocurrencies and this only came out thanks to cryptocurrencies, which is completely untrue. Is it possible? Is it true that they're using it still? Yes, absolutely. But they're still using cash. They're still using the other methodologies that are not technologically driven. So let's not discount that component. Um, and of course, I mean, so many examples, so many examples of like poor things. And I'm like, it's so many examples of good stuff. But I think it's important that we understand that there are many sort of big things of what's bad. Then they talk about the criminal code and the authorities like wire fraud, the mail fraud, securities fraud, uh, access device fraud, 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 <laughs> all these frauds. Um, and so, you know, they're talking about that stuff and talk about the regulatory authorities and kind of how it all works and how it all, you know, uh, how, you know, it's been used for the dark nets. And I'm like, dark net existed before this stuff. A lot of the dark net is being shut down now. Um, and so now they go in and talk about the financial crimes, reform and network, bank secrecy acts and that stuff. So they talk about the bank secrecy acts, which is BSA, the uh, Treasury financial crimes uh, network, uh, which is the FinCEN, which we've been talking about. Uh, remember, FinCEN is the one that done a report on the big banks and how they are bankrolling everybody, not using crypto, by the way. Mm. So uh, they're the big ones. Uh, then, of course, they're talking about the Financial Intelligence Unit, FIU, the Convertible Digital Curse, CVC. So they love, 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 love acronyms. They love acronyms. Um, they love acronyms. And so, you know, the, when you read this, you're like, what, what, what is this? What is this? But one of the interesting pieces that they're talking about is that anytime, anytime anything crypto-related, technology-related, touches any uh, uh, server in the U.S. that is connected with anything monetarily whatsoever, you fall under the U.S. laws and regulations. So even if you're not located, even if you're not located in United States or anywhere near United States, you're not even incorporated in the United States, they basically are saying that they have issued a rule that Money transmission services include accepting and transmitting currency funds or other value that substitutes for currency. Hold on, I need to make this bigger so you can actually see it. Um, 
by any means. This phrase, other value that substitutes currency, was intended to cover situations when transmission includes something that parties recognize has value that is equivalent to or can substitute for fiat currency. The definition of money transition technology neutral, whatever the platform protocol or mechanism, the acceptance and transmission of value from one person to another in one location or another is regular and under the BSA. So basically, uh, they have expanded what the uh, transmission, money transmission service means, right? Um, that's an interesting piece. They also have gone out and basically said that any time that, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, you know, you use, uh, you know, any type of service that is in any way, shape, or form uh, connected to the U U.S., it will fall under the U.S. laws. So it's very interesting how uh, the U.S. agencies, through this whole Internet component, are very much globalizing and saying, well, I mean, in many ways, it's sort of like them saying we own the Internet. Um, and I don't know how well that is going to go, probably as well as a church uh, or curse in a church, as they say. Um, but that is one of the pieces that they are talking about as well. And, of course, they're talking about how they're integrating with Department of Justice. And, uh, uh, you know, th here's the part piece. Um, here's the piece that I wanted to share with you. FinCEN requirement apply equally to all domestic and foreign located MB MSBs, even if the foreign located MSB does not have a physical presence in the United States. The MSB need only do business in whole or substantial part in the United States. In addition, parties become money transmitters and therefore MSBs, whether they exchange from fiat to convertible virtual currency or from one virtual currency to another virtual currency, or as we talked about the fact that they are um, and transmitting any messages that have any relation to the money whatsoever. So this is a very, very broad way of what they're discussing and the challenging piece is that likely is going to fall under the IRS that they're going to start accepting all kinds of crazy stuff, especially as we get into the conversation of what's happening in the states like California, which we're going to talk about in a moment um, about the taxation and that kind of stuff. So you definitely want to be aware of those things and pay attention. Then we have the Office of Foreign Asset Control. Of course, they're involved, the IRS. So they're like putting all of these case studies of like the different acts and kind of how it all works and who's involved and how they're differently uh, participating in it. And again, if you go to the Department of Justice website, you will be able to download the whole thing. 83 pages, feel free to read it. They do talk about the IRS and the fact that they are putting new regulations and all of those different things. Uh, then you have the FAT, uh, the Financial Action Task Force and how they're involved. Um, and, uh, you know, really talk about the ongoing challenges which is the fact that the business model and activities are, you know, of course, uh, changing all the times. And they're talking about the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, the cryptocurrency exchanges, and how it all works. You know, the, the, the Bitcoin ATM business is brought up. Uh, they talked about the uh, Telegram ICO um, and specifically in this particular thing. So here's the cryptocurrency kiosks, right? which is the, so they talk about this stuff and how they're responsible for KYC as well, uh, the virtual currency casinos, uh, right? And so they talk about the illicit use of it as well. Uh, this is the part where we're talking about, you know, the fact that they are very bearish news for things like Dash, Monero, and Zcash uh, because they're trying to obscure all of the stuff. They are very, very... Um, not liking that stuff at all. Mixer stumblers, chain chopping, and that stuff. Uh, they talk about those components. If you're interested to learn how it all works, uh, you definitely want to read that. And I'm sure that there's additional pieces that you want to read. Um, you know, the services that tumble and stuff, uh, they're probably going to go after those folks as well. So all of those like privacy, safety coins, and that stuff, I can see that being uh, very, very bearish uh, news for them and potentially being, uh, you know, potentially being the end of uh, days for these particular things. Is it possible? Is it not? I don't know. I don't know anything. Uh, but it is something that I see potentially, potentially, you know, really, 
struggling on the uh, both long and short term. Uh, so that's something you definitely want to understand. Um, this is the part right over here. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see if I can find. Uh, they talk about the BTCE and Alpha Bay. Uh, what kind of has happened? And like illicit. Like what happens when they basically uh, take stuff out of uh, an exchange and kind of what the path it goes through to get it to cash. Uh, and uh, let me see. Trying to see, yeah, they talk about the European uh, Union general data protection regulation and the fact that they are also supporting and that there's a lot of uh, collaboration between uh, the agencies and between the countries to try to keep everything safe. So um, overall, and then it goes into a bunch of the notes and stuff. I couldn't find over here while we were looking at it uh, to talk to you about the uh, the, the telegram ICO stuff uh, and uh, but they did talk about the fact that like wait a minute you can't just roll it out and stuff and you got to roll all back in and, and BitMEX now is the new thing so I think paying attention to regulations is huge and I know it is one of those things that is uh, making me lose a little bit of sleep at night I sleep like a baby typically but because of the things that we are rolling out and preparing to roll out in in our business and in my life, um, I am very, very concerned about the whole thing of how it all will work out and trying to figure out what makes the most sense uh, to be able to be able to do this well. Um, and, you know, without like having to go to the full blown SEC um, in Sanorama because it's just it's, you know, it, it's a huge expense piece and I'm not trying to avoid it in any means. I just don't want to roll out a security, right? I don't want to roll out the security. And so that's my biggest thing of uh, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And we'll see if, if it has to be, if it's deemed a security and it has to be security and we have to go through SEC filing, then so be it, we'll do it. Uh, but I would, uh, you know, obviously prefer if, uh, if we don't go that route, if, if that's not where we are right now. Uh, maybe down the line, you know, uh, we want to do a security and that's fine. But right now I don't, I really don't, I don't want to deal with it. Um, okay. All right. All right. All right. Now it's time. It's time to change pace and conversation. And this is a perfect segment talking about my personal life to talk about this stuff because, because the coins that we're talking about are connected to the real estate, right? So I'm connecting the blockchain and the crypto and real estate, and that's what the goal is of the entire project. Well, not the, the only goal, one of many, many goals. Um, and, uh, you know, the update on the project is uh, that, uh, you know, the, the new piece of uh, tech stuff has come through. Of course, something else broke. <laughs> I feel like that's the story of my life, y'all. We get one piece of tech to work, another piece of tech breaks, and uh, then we got to go from the scratch. So, uh, But the good news is we'll definitely get it done. It should be a relatively minutia piece to get fixed. Um, right after actually the episode, right after the show, I'm going to be following up with the team to see where we are. And fingers crossed, fingers crossed, when we get that done, um, we'll be ready to launch for beta. So let's see. Let's see. We do have such small things, but they're like super small, but they're huge, right? So anyways, that's why I'm saying it's perfect segment to switch over. And of course, what we're going to talk about when we talk about the regulations and taxes and everything else crazy, California. That's right. You guessed it right. We're going to be talking about California. Californication means it's taxation. And of course, here we go. Here we go. Uh, California will vote on whether to hike property taxes on business. So what's going on? The new proposal on November to uh, third ballot is estimated to generate up to twelve billion dollars in new revenue amid fiscal crisis. But business groups warned it will result in the largest property tax increase in state history at a time when small businesses can uh, cannot afford it at all and might I say might very likely decide they're just going to leave. So not only, you know, they're looking at what it could potentially generate, uh, 
Uh, but you know what? You saddle all of these businesses with all of this extra stuff, and at some point they just say, bunk this. I'm moving out. And folks are moving out, and folks are leaving, and I'm afraid this happens. More people will leave. Uh, but again, we'll see. We'll see how it's all going to roll out. Let's learn and then Nev commentary. Nev, shut up now and let's just learn. California's current property tax addict for position 13 is one of the most restrictive measures of its kind in the country and has the effect of creating a lopsided system in which comparable properties in the same neighborhood can pay vastly different property taxes. Prop 13 capped local property tax uh, rates at 1% and ended the practice of taxing property based on the full market value. Annual property tax increase are priced uh, capped at 2%. The proposed ballot measure in California, hold on, let me pause here for a moment. So basically that means that when you buy a property, right, and it's an assessed value, the longer you own it, the less, uh, you know, taxation you pay. Well, not the less, right, but your taxation rate doesn't go as up as fast but your neighbor who might have bought the exact same property a year ago is going to be paying way more tax than you who paid and bought the property, say, 10 years ago. And we also do know, and I do teach in my courses, that when you sell a property, or sorry, when you buy a property, because when you sell it doesn't really matter, you don't have a taxation on that property anymore, but when you buy, when you buy a property, uh, you should be prepared that whatever taxes were before, that the taxes are going to adjust on up. Um, unless we've had a giant down year and everything has been overpriced and now they're just adjusting it down. In, in, in just about any normal par market, you can expect that your taxes are going to go up and go up uh, significantly. And then after that, they're going to have small adjustments potentially. So when you are accounting for that, especially as an investor, you absolutely want to account for that. So that's basically what this means here. And California is not the only one that has this, but you know it might be more prominent um, because their prices also tend to move way, way, way more than anybody else. Uh, the proposed ballot measure in California wouldn't change any of that for homeowners in their primary residence, but it would end that practice for commercial and industrial properties valued over three million, which is super easy to do in state of California. Create a split role property tax system where these high value commercial and industrial properties would be taxed on full market value and reassessed every three years. Residential properties, including apartment buildings and agricultural uh, land would remain under the current uh, Prop 13 limit. Now, here's the interesting piece. So they're basically saying for now, residential properties, including apartment buildings, wouldn't uh, go into it. But I think if they approve it, the next one is going to be large properties. They will target large, uh, large landlords. So that's just my belief uh, because that's how typically things roll out. You want the rich guys and then the rich ends up being the amount ends up being smaller. You want the big business and the size of the big keeps on going down. Just like when we talk about affordable housing, which we're going to be talking about, the affordable keeps changing. It's eye of the beholder, as they say. So an interesting thing that they're also talking about is that going to be, um, you know, they're going to basically reassess the property every three years. Well, that means uh, the size of the government and the assessor's office is going to have to go up because they just don't have enough people to go out there and do all of that research. And they're also saying that it's going to be, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, where did it go? Full market value. Well, how are you going to determine the full market value? The only way the full market value can truly be determined is if it goes on the market and it's a free market and the price is established between the buyer and the seller. That is the only way to figure out the true full market price. Everything else is an assessment, is an estimation, is a guesstimation at best. And a lot of times it could be very educated guess, but it's not a market value. Market value is what a buyer agrees to buy it for and seller agrees to let it for. That is called the price discovery, something which we haven't had in a very long time 
thanks to government's goosing up of just about everything out there. And now they're going to goose up one thing that is potentially honest, which is real estate. So, um, or physical real estate. And the reason I say that it was potentially only honest thing is because it truly was between the buyer and the seller of what we agreed to let the go or buy it for. All right. Proponents say the money could help save off save off massive budget cuts and local services and programs. It's going to help everybody. You can clearly see how I feel about the whole thing. Um, look, I, I think it's a really stupid idea. Stupid idea um, because when you massively increase the taxation on businesses and people, they up and leave. They simply cannot afford it. They foreclose it and move on now what right what is your ultimate goal we tend to look very closely at what we want which is just sort of like give me the money and we think that just rolling out taxation to the rich to the wealthy to the business to the big bad wolf out there uh, that is going to solve all of our problems but it doesn't it requires bigger thinking, longer term thinking than just this. I don't know what the answer is, but rolling out and just slapping another sort of coat of paint on the house that is breaking down does not make sense in my humble opinion. You let me know how you feel about the whole thing, but I personally don't enjoy it. Uh, supporters also know that the current system disproportionately benefits the owners of commercial properties, which tend not to change hands as frequently as residential. Well, simple. Don't sell the property, right? Hold on to it. And yeah, sure, it might. Maybe you change it that, uh, you know, the adjustment is a bit different, that, you know, it's reassessed or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, uh, but there are big problems and, and giant problems that I think need to be discussed, deeply, deeply discussed into what makes sense. Uh, opponents warned that Proposition 15's effort of target high-value properties does not exempt small business owners from tax, tax hikes. Small business leasing space um, in higher-end value uh, commercial properties will likely have their tax increase passed on to them through the terms in their lease, and they do. Most of the commercial leases, it's not like just a monthly payments of $1,000 a month and you move on. No, 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 no. These lease payments are typically longer term. They have the annual sort of increase of the stuff. They are charged and responsible. It's very much like ownership. You're responsible for fixing everything, cleaning everything, uh, taxation, uh, you know, regulation, uh, snow cleanup, energy, like everything. The only thing that the owner basically has is they just happen to own the building. You got to do everything else. You got to do everything else. And if the, even if the taxation kind of falls onto the owner, uh, typically these lease agreements basically says that any change to the, the taxation goes directly to the, uh, to the tenants. So some of the places, and there were folks that were saying like, wait a minute, you know, um, I have a restaurant and I knew what my bill was going to be, right? And, uh, you know, now my lease cost could go from the 6000 to well over 36000 I can't afford that. And I basically will have to shut down, as will many other businesses. The tax assessors in the area also warned that it would create administrative chaos because it requires an estimated 12-fold increase in reassessments annually. Remember, so they would have to hire more people and move on to the higher component things. We'll see how the whole thing is going to play out, but I think it's about to get worse. Oh, look at this. This one is about to get worse too. No, no. Where are we going? Oh, oh, yeah. So let's talk higher ed, y'all. Let's talk higher ed. And uh, there is ominous clowns in the higher education in the campuses, colleges, universities, and, uh, you know, especially for the smaller, especially for the private, because, you know, the public ones, the government might still attempt to sort of save off and keep safe and that kind of stuff. But I think when it comes to the larger ones, uh, or sorry, the, the, the private ones, this is where we might see some challenges. 
and I think it's going to roll on up to the midsize and the larger size. So we will see. For years, for years, for years, for years, I have been predicting that, and this is, I probably st stated this prediction out loud for the first time in mid 2000s, uh, so early 2000s, so about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I have stated that over the next 20 to 30 years, so next, what do we have? five to 15 years now, right? Uh, five to 15 years, so um, we are going to see way less institutions. We're going to see massive closures, uh, mergers, acquisitions, uh, sales all happening. And it's starting to unravel and unravel at a faster pace. And we're going to see it uh, more and more. So here is a story out of Forbes um, that is talking about a few different schools and because I happen to have a little bit of an inside scoop um, I might I might share it. I'm not promising um, You know, I got to protect the innocent in this case myself. Thank you very much So I may or may not have inside information in any of this stuff And of course if it's something that is very politically stuff I'm not gonna share it because I don't think it's fair to the institutions um, and you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I am not a type of person that wants to air everybody's dirty laundry because that's just not my style. Um, okay. So there was a history underfoot of Vermont's Marlboro college tucked away in the green mountains. And I will tell you, I have learned of the sale of this property and looked at it and it's just, uh, based on the location and where, what I am trying to do and kind of where I am in my life. I passed on to the opportunity, but it is an amazing opportunity. It is beautiful college, beautiful location. Um, it's 533 acre campus, and it was sold for only, the, the selling price, the listing price was way higher than that. I can assure you of that because I have personally looked into it. I have looked into it personally. Uh, but it was sold for only 1.7 to five million dollars in cash and debt plus operating expenses um, which is you know the some reportedly far below the property says value I assure you I assure you this is the insider information I'm saying I have some for some I have and for some I don't this was short way 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 under assessed value this might as well been gifted it might as well been gifted. So the buyer of this thing, I mean, basically got it for nothing. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what it's going to become, but they basically got it for nothing. And what they're saying is it's hardly um, a loan. We have a list over here. We're going to talk about it in a moment um, of independent small colleges that are facing merge or perish reality. And the pandemic has only made that problem worse more closures will come soon. And the question that some folks are having is why? Well, the cost of education is not right free. I mean, it costs a lot of money. And with a lot of things kind of going remote, uh, because, well, A, the government says you have to, right? So you gotta follow that. B, many people are saying, I don't, I don't wanna be around other people. If you can teach me this way, teach me this way. I don't, I don't want to be in classrooms. I don't want to share buildings with other people. I feel much more comfortable in my humble abode and my backyard and all of that stuff for the same reason that people are going out there and buying homes is the same reason that folks are going out there and saying, I don't want to do this in-person learning. Give it to me remotely and make it super fun and exciting and all of that stuff. So, and of course, with the rise of YouTube and everything else, you know, uh, younger generation is getting used to this stuff. And I have been saying, and you're hearing it here probably for the first time from everybody. Again, I've been saying for years, I believe that colleges and universities as we know it, as the ones that I have grew up with are going to completely disappear. There might be a few here or there, Ivy League, high priority, like a high, you know, sort of seen as a luxury thing like it was back in 1600s of going to the school that might still have the on-ground in-person experience and stuff. Vast majority of higher education is going to go AR and VR. Argumented reality, 
virtual reality. There's going to be some sort of goggles, and that is how you're going to attend school. I know how it sounds. I know it sounds insane. But someday in the future, hopefully this video will still exist out there, and we can all go back and say, this crazy dude Nev has said it in 2020. And I've actually said it before, but now it's like super public because it's going to go out and sort of live on the net for forever. Has said it, and uh, look, it's coming true. So get ready for that stuff. Hey, if you're a leader of college university, you are listening to this stuff, you're on the board of directors, pay attention. Pay attention and get ready right now. All right. So, um, but this is what's happening. And of course, now they're listing. Let me see if I can make this bigger. No can do. No can do. I tried y'all. I tried y'all. Um, you're just going to have to trust me on this one. And you can't really click on it. Can you? View image in a new tab. Yes, you can. All right. So here you go. Here you go. You have a list of a few schools. Uh, that are and you will notice one very interesting trend where are majority of these schools located well you will see one state pop up a lot Vermont we have three institutions that are in Vermont the next ones is Massachusetts right we have two students in Massachusetts two in New York so we're looking at New England predominantly New England we do have one in Illinois and then we have uh, North Miami, Florida, and Denver, Colorado uh, campuses as well. Um, so this is, this is an interesting one to really understand. So vast majority of these closures is in New England schools. New England schools and New England also tends to have a lot more concentrated component of the especially small private institutions. And so we are seeing that, you know, you can even see that some of these schools that were founded in the 1800s, you know, early 1900s. Um, you know, obviously there are some that we have one that like Marlboro College was in 1946. One in, uh, you know, Newbury was in 1962. Uh, but uh, you will see that some of the sales, you know, uh, I mean, I think that... Uh, Newbury College and College of New Rochelle sold, you know, relatively speaking, nicely at 32 and 34 uh, million dollars. But then Vermont has been selling uh, dirt cheap, and Southern Vermont College apparently is uh, year close 2019. Um, I haven't looked at this one, and given that it's TBD, guess what? Nev is very curious right now. So guess what I might be doing at the end of the show? That's right. That's right. I might follow up with the programming crew and then take a look at what's going on, what's going on with a couple of the schools. Like, what is the price? I'm curious. And I'm curious not just, you know, for, like I said, not in the business of airing anybody's dirty laundry. It is what it is. Um, there are plenty of people that are happy to do that. Not my style. Um, but I do it for my own personal, I want to know. You know, I want to know. Who knows? I might want to invest in it. I might want to buy it. If it makes sense, if it's an occasion and I can come up with something cool to do it. Hey, yeah. Mm. So anyways, um, but uh, th what they're basically saying is that, the, you know, uh, so they struggle with, with where they are. And here what they're saying is the only way out becomes unthinkable, unloading the most valuable asset in order to pay off the creditors. Now, I do want to keep in mind and let you know that not every um, institution in this book right over here that we just talked about in this thing is owing money okay or having to pay off the creditors some of these schools yes that is the truth some of these schools have closed because the interest and stuff didn't exist some of the schools it was the um, accreditation component that was just too much and not quite happening and some of it was a strategic move for positioning into the new dog. So just please understand this part over here is not completely accurate. And they're saying for some, right? But I also want to understand that folks will read this stuff and think that it's everybody on the list. And that is not true. 
you'll have my word on it. I'm not going to share who, what, when, where, or how. I'm just going to say it's not true for everybody and just take my word on it. Um, and of course, I can prove it if I need to at a court of law. So go for it if you really, really want to and get ready to lose because I am a vindictive, vindictive type of person. I can be very evil, I think. Um, but just understand it's not everybody, okay? Uh, <coughs> now, of course, it rarely goes smoothly and it gets kind of ugly. Uh, Marlboro alums uh, started a petition in the trying to cope, hope to uh, stop the sale. Of course, they failed. Uh, then we're seeing, you know, other places where they were like going through and trying to stall it and that kind of stuff. And it gets really, really ugly. Uh, we're going to see the uh, this trend continue and it's going to accelerate. This is coming from the higher education specialist at CBRE, Nina Farrell or Farrell. Um, and uh, uh, the most vulnerable schools are the ones that have been operating on thin profits and more likely a deficit for some time. Oh, no, you can't see this. Sorry, I forgot to change screens. I apologize. So here it is right over here is uh, what we talked about. Um, and I agree with that stuff that you have some that have gone on a super thin line and deficit. But like I said, some of these, it's not the fact of the thing. All right. Ooh, man, we're running out of time. I got to do this faster. I got to do this faster because we're coming on only on top of the hour. So what we might do is just um, we might do a faster chat or shorter chat or something like that. Um, anyways, this is incredibly important. You need to understand this stuff. Because many people don't know these loans, don't know about these loans, and these loans could be a way for you to get into a property. So let's learn about it. And please understand, I am not a get into the property at all costs. You have got to do the math. You have got to do the math. You have got to do the math, especially if it's an investment. But I think the more you know, the smarter you become, the easier it is for you to understand, do I get in, do I not get in? So if you're going to invest or buy for your own personal leisure, so to say, a property outside of a city. There's one particular loan that you could look into that most people don't, that most people don't, that could potentially make all the difference between buying and not buying, between making money and losing money. You want to know what that is? I am certain of it. And that is what we're going to cover tomorrow, first thing in the morning. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But look, y'all, we're getting over an hour thing over here. Well, not over an hour, but we're hitting an hour. And you know how I get into this stuff. I'm going to start explaining. I'm going to start teaching. I'm going to start showing. So look, if this is something that you want to learn, I know it's a little bit of a teaser and a cliffhanger. My apologies for that. Not intended. I just sometimes I get so much stuff that we just can't get it into one episode. So if this is something you want to learn, make sure you come tomorrow to onedealaway.com slash live sign in so we can do a Q&A as well. Or if you are not interested, you're like, ah, it's too early now. I can't do that because of where I live and the time of the whole thing. Um, but if you want to do a live, it's at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Um, you know, then just watch it wherever you watch it. Typically, just do me a huge favor. Subscribe. Subscribe, smash the like button, hit the bell button for notification, and you'll get notified, and you'll get all of this information tomorrow. I thank you very much for watching. Until next time, stay forever, money blessed, and do remember, you are only one deal away.